Uh, let me figure out, okay, yes. Um, so, Zhilin Yang is the first author of this. He was the, uh, the person who did all of the coding and most of the thinking. Uh, two others of us uh, were Shibarna and myself, Shibarna Sena, who's a research scientist in my lab, and me, and uh, we coached and made suggestions for things for him to try that didn't work for the most part, but mostly he did it. So this was his summer project. Stanford has an exchange program with some of the best universities in China, where our School of Engineering uh, is called the Undergraduate Visiting Researcher Program, and they provide labs at Stanford with interns. So this was my summer intern from China. He's from Tsinghua University. He was uh, in between his junior and senior years. And uh, he had a strong background, still has a strong background, in data retrieval and machine learning, stronger than mine. So I had another project in mind for him, but the Dream AML Challenge came out shortly before he showed up. And so I suggested that he do that because it had clearly defined goals and seemed like a nice constrained thing for a student to do over the summer. Furthermore, both Shibarna and I had been working on analyzing AML data as part of the TCGA project. We knew a certain number of AML clinicians uh, around campus that we could talk to about the project. So it seemed like a good fit. So uh, Zhilin uh, is applying to PhD programs now. I recommend that if he applies to your program, you admit him, and I'm willing to put that in writing. I expect to be doing so next week. So we wanted to make this a little bit more than an exercise in machine learning. So we wanted to actually make use of the protein and data, array data, which turned out to be more difficult than uh, we anticipated because the clinical features were very effective for classification and also because uh, the protein array data is apparently very noisy. So I'll have some more comments about the data later. But uh, the, the other thing we wanted to do was use some sort of biological prior knowledge to improve results. Now, what I suggested to Zhilin is that we make pathway diagrams and figure out uh, what the causality, causal relationships were between the various proteins that were measured on the arrays, et cetera. After working on it for a while, it became clear that that was hopeless. So we uh, resorted to at least you know, finally listing genes in the various pathways and trying to use that to improve our classification. And in fact, for subchallenge one, we actually uh, succeeded in improving our scores somewhat. So, uh, but it wasn't easy to do. We felt that it was a triumph to be able to use the protein data effectively and to actually bring some biological knowledge into the process. So our general approach for subchallenge one, which I'll spend most of my time on, uh, was uh, to try all standard classification and prediction methods and evaluate a lot with cross-validation. Um, after getting our basic off-the-shelf machine learning method, we did a manual override which is basically a kludge that we found to be useful, which was simply to list the flu HDAC treatment as a perfect predictor of remission, and that worked very well for us. Then uh, we came up with one idea, which I think is interesting, and I'll say that Zhilin came up with this idea, which to use, was to use dictionary learning for sparse coding uh, for the protein features, and then, of course, spent, we spent a lot of time on parameter tuning and feature selection. So I'll talk about each of these issues in a little more detail. I should mention that we were actually listed as uh, co-winners of the uh, sub-challenge on uh, uh, the remission prediction. So I'm not just going off on a random tangent here, I hope. Uh, anyway, so the basic theme of this is actually trying lots of things that don't work in order to find uh, the, the best ones. Okay, so the basic classifier we used was a support vector machine with RBF kernel. I'm probably less qualified in machine learning than almost everyone in the audience, so I'll leave it at that, I think. We used a hybrid feature selection where we used different criteria for continuous and categorical features. I'll talk about that in a little more detail. We used a Boolean rule, uh, so we just said if the patient was treated, received the flu HDAC treatment, then uh, say they're going to go into remission, and uh, we use this feature learning uh, thing, the dictionary learning for sparse coding. Okay, so I don't really need to explain SVMs, so I'll leave the picture here that I stole from Wikipedia. We used a radial basis function which permits non a nonlinear separating boundary, and I'll just put a bunch of fine print here for various other things we tried that did not work as well. Now, some of these things probably work for other people. Uh, this successor or less success in this depends on many, many different factors, including luck, I think, and 
Uh, there are so many different parameters and methods and options and things you can put into the workflow that I'm not sure we can find the optimal thing. We just had to do our best job for finding something that worked for us. But a whole lot of work went into trying things that didn't work. Okay, so the first kludge that I mentioned was, uh, I should mention that the SVM worked quite well and got us, I think, number six in the ranking the first time we tried it. And then we tried looking at a little more detail in the data. So uh, we uh, have this data mining method called uh, Boolean implications that we have used for a number of different things. And I won't go into detail on it, but we just run over the data looking for if-then rules in the data. If something is high, something else is low, for example. So we tried that on this data and came up with several different rules. And one of them was the flu HDAC treatment, which uh, turns out to result in remission 29 out of 30 times in the training set. And so we just manually added this rule that said if the patient was treated in this particular way, uh, say they're going to go into re remission. So this didn't really help with the BAC score. Uh, so the SVM comes back with a number. And if that number is greater than or equal to 0.5, then we say it's re predicting remission. Otherwise, we say it's not predicting remission. But it does help with the area under the curve. So the area under the curve basically relates to the number of out-of-order pairs that uh, we're going to have when we, if you rank everything by the number that comes back from the SVM. And so if we put in this rule that says, uh, with flu HDAC, this patient is going to go into remission, it improves, it improves the AUROC because it makes sure that those flu HDAC patients are at the top of the rank and that nothing else can get out of order with them. We used a hybrid feature selection algorithm uh, once again, this is very simple. It might have been the obvious thing for people to use, but we only came to it after trying dozens of other things. So we used a Fisher's exact test to rank categorical features. We used Spearman correlation to uh, rank numerical features, did lots of cross-validation to find the optimal number of features uh, after ranking them in this way, and uh, this worked the best of, out of many other methods. Okay, so the thing that was most interesting that Zhilin came up with was the dictionary learning for sparse coding. Now, my understanding is that this is a method that's used frequently in image uh, classification, right, in data retrieval for images. And in a brief search of the bioinformatic literature via PubMed, I saw that it was used occasionally in PubMed, but usually for analysis of medical images. So I'm not sure to what extent it's used for other bioinformatic data, but uh, I wasn't familiar with it. So the idea is, is sort of a dimension reduction method. The idea is you start, in this case, with 191 patients. You've got this matrix of numbers. So the rows of the patients, the columns of the proteins, we're going to reduce that to approximately six uh, latent states, which have all of the protein numbers. But uh, uh, these six vectors will be uh, every patient will be approximated, every patient vector will be approximated by a weighted sum of these six vectors. And the interesting thing is that it has to be a sparse weighted sum. So there's a penalty term in there that causes uh, most of the coefficients to be zero or lots of the coefficients to be zero. So that each patient data vector can be written as a small number of the already small number of latent states uh, weighted appropriately. So our hope with this is that these latent states, this is, this is an unsupervised learning method. Uh, and our hope with this is that these latent states somehow squeeze out the redundancy in the protein data and capture interesting things that are going on in the individual cells. So we mostly don't know what those interesting things are, but it seemed to work uh, reasonably well once, once we applied it. So these latent states become new additional features that we could use. And in fact, in the classification, we just use the latent states and not the raw protein data. Okay, so this turns out to be a convex optimization problem. I don't think I'm gonna, you either are the kind of person who looks at this and says, oh yeah, there's an L2 norm and an L1 norm with a penalty term, or you're not, and so I'll move on. Um, okay, so uh, good. The pathway-specific sparse coding we applied in three different ways. We did the dictionary coding for three different sets. We did it for all proteins, and this is where the biological knowledge comes in. We took a list of proteins that are purported to be involved in the apoptosis pathway and just did sparse coding over those. And we did the same thing with cell cycle proteins. 
So this actually worked reasonably well. Now, the caveat is that the SVM got us most of the way there, and so uh, everything else we used just bumped up the, score, the, the performance a little bit. And so in this graph, CLI is the clinical features alone, uh, GLOB is sparse coding on all proteins, and PATH is sparse coding on proteins in the two pathways I just mentioned. And you can see that as, uh, in general, that when you put all of these things together, it works best. And so this achieved the dual goals of actually making use of the protein data and including some biological prior knowledge in terms of the lists of genes involved in each of these pathways in getting an improved classifier. So we felt good about that. Okay, so uh, if it's visible in these plots, uh, this is Jilin's effort to show that there's actually discrimination happening because of the uh, pathway-specific sparse coding. And so individual, there's a big blob in the middle that it didn't really help with very much, but on the sides, uh, you can see that individual latent states were useful in segregating out remission and non-remission cases in, in various, uh, for various patients. So it was difficult to interpret what these dictionary uh, vectors actually represent, the latent state vectors. But at least in one case, we're able to go through and say, well, maybe there's something biological happening in this particular uh, vector. And so if we look at the cell cycle pathway, there are a couple of regulators of phosphorylation of RB1 that uh, appear to be inhibiting phosphorylation, or th they appear to be not there. And so RB1 is not getting phosphorylated, and thus perhaps this is inhibiting the cell cycle. But we're not able to interpret these, partly due to not spending a great deal of time on it, and maybe because of inherent difficulty. I wanted to make a couple of remarks about the data, just random observations for people who might be trying the extended challenge. Um, so there's some correlation between the clinical and protein features, in particular blood count uh, blood cell count features, white blood cells, blasts, et cetera, were highly correlated with the protein features. The good news there is there's some signal in the protein features. Uh, the bad news is the protein signal that we're seeing represents variation in the cell populations, not differential activity in the cells. Now, we tried various ways of compensating for this, but it seemed like the dictionary coding worked reasonably well. Um, anyway, I have looked a little bit at flow cytometry data, that single cell data, and you don't see the same phenomenon there. Uh, the protein features were highly correlated, and this is probably why we're able to get away with something like five or six latent state vectors when we do the sparse coding without losing much useful information. And another thing which we were not able to exploit uh, uh, and don't know what the cause of is what seems to be a pretty visible batch effect. So if you just draw the heat map of the various protein data and sort just by patient index, there seems to be a, a visible difference, maybe not visible in this slide, but there are big patches of blue below the line and big patches of red above the line and vice versa. So there's significant variation. I don't know what this is coming from. Uh, this is a case where in a real research project, I would immediately go back to the people who got the data, ask what was going on and try to, to learn how to uh, compensate for the effect. Um, it, one of the things about Participating in a competition like this, is it's hard to do that. So it's one of the cases where a competition is not as good as being in a real research situation, perhaps. Okay, I'll mention challenge number two, which we also came in first. Uh, we don't have as much to say. It was basically a straightforward machine learning task. So we used support vector regression with a linear kernel. Uh, we did feature extraction. This is a case where talking to various doctors helped. We grouped the cytogenetics features into three clusters, low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And uh, we did the hybrid feature selection that I mentioned already. And then we used model stacking as a simple ensemble approach where we just average the results um, of, of these various models. And in fact, Jilin got the idea for doing that by looking at the wisdom of crowds results that were posted on, on the leaderboard at some point. Unfortunately, we're not able to usefully make meaningful use of the protein features in this challenge. Um, and uh, this goes into a little more detail. So basically, we use three support vector regression uh, regressions with two different hyperparameters and, and uh, all of the clinical features in two cases and just five clinical features in another case. Um, and then he used lots of cross-validation to tune everything. 
Challenge number three, we actually came in in second place, and I just put in a couple slides here because it's fast, but it's essentially the same approach we used for challenge number two, uh, so, uh, but a little more complicated. So some of the, the first two bullets are the same. We use two feature selection strategies, uh, ranking by uh, Spearman's correlation and then removing the 10 lowest features and uh, using uh, the f same five features I mentioned earlier. And then we did, uh, we used model stacking for these guys too. Okay, so conclusions. We attributed our success in the challenges to trying everything we could think of or that Gilen could think of, and uh, particularly quickly testing ideas that don't work. The sparse coding idea, I think is actually potentially interesting, and I think it's an attractive idea to use in other bioinformatics tasks. Uh, maybe we'll experiment with, with it more in the future. And one thing that's not accounted for is that this is a non-deterministic process, and luck may have played a significant role. So we noted that through the duration of the contest, uh, the various teams were moving up and down in the rankings a lot, and it didn't seem to be terribly stable. So uh, I have this nagging feeling in the back of my mind that perhaps there was a random element in coming out uh, as we did in the rankings, but I'm not going to let that nag me too much. Uh, the protein data was very noisy, and it's probably a limited factor to significantly improving results. I imagine they can be improved some, but uh, this is a case where the challenge is not really comparable to real research. Um, the dream competitions are very nice if synchronized with summer internships. I think making dream challenges successful is really a question about incentives. And one of the incentives, since you know, basically we're getting free labor from the participants, one of the incentives to think about is uh, how to make it easy for people. And having summer interns work on these tasks is uh, a really interesting way to participate in a challenge. And it's very good for the students who get the opportunity to do it. Uh, a few random thoughts about uh, DREAM. Uh, good things are, you know, it's democratic. Anybody can participate. Makes for good summer projects. And one of the things I noticed in the rheumatoid arthritis challenge, which I think is really interesting from a research perspective, is that the dream challenges are not biased towards positive results. You know, there's a score at the end. If you didn't use the protein data or didn't use the genomic data for the rheumatoid arthritis challenge, well, that's how you got the best score. You know, you might imagine that somebody in a similar situation with the same data would try a bunch of experiments uh, computationally until eventually they made the right use of the protein array data and managed to bring in all the pathways and do something like that that would be a basis for a good paper, and that that paper might be more likely to be accepted than somebody who just maximized the predictive value and didn't make use of the data. With the dream challenge, it's more objective in this sense, and we actually get those negative results out rather than uh, possibly spurious positive results. Um, the less good is that there are barrier, bar barriers to communication with the data generators. Uh, unlike a real research situation in some cases. And I think there are some opp opportunities. If we focus on the incentives and the dream challenge, uh, you can get more people to participate and work harder. Uh, one suggestion I have there is more fanfare, like a, something on the homepage saying who the names of the winners are and a press release or something. It's cheap and helps to motivate people. And it would be really interesting to look at models for increased cooperation between the people. I know when I, we were participating in this, I was just wondering, how are those other teams doing so well? What tricks are they using? And trying to uh, uh, read people's minds or something to figure that out. You know, actual communication, if we can motivate people to cooperate instead of competing, uh, would, might lead to better results. But it's not a non-trivial problem to figure out how to make, create those incentives. So thanks, of course, to the dream competition, also to people who helped us, uh, various uh, people at Stanford uh, that we had worked with before in other capacities, Stanford School of Engineering UGVR program, which provided Jilin to work with us, who uh, did such great work on this project, and the, uh, our grant from the National Cancer Institute. We're part of the Center for Cancer Systems Biology at Stanford, which is how we had the context and how we managed to learn a little bit about AML so we could actually do this. Thank you.